Hi, this is Chaplain Greg, your Wandering Wesleyan with our Walking in the Word series. And Pastor Brandon is on sabbatical, so I'm using his office. And uh, see, all these books make me look wicked smart, don't they? Um, if you like this channel, if you like what you're learning, um, I ask that you like and subscribe on Facebook, leave a comment, share the video with folks. Um, and uh, we can get this material out to, to more folks that are interested. Um, where are we at? Well, we left at exile. Uh, Assyria has taken the northern kingdom into captivity. Assyria is conquered by Babylon. Babylon comes down and takes the southern kingdom into captivity. The temple is destroyed. And uh, boy, it's bad. It's bad. Everybody's taken off. So we're going to talk about the exile for a little bit. The Northern Kingdom entered into exile with the Assyrian invasion in 732. Remember, that was the one date you need to remember. All of those tribes in the Northern Kingdom, Dan, Issachar, Reuben, Naphtali, they're lost in history. They're just gone. The southern kingdom, however, went into exile 145 years later by Babylon, and that was in 587. That was the other date that I wanted you to write down, 587 BC, and that's when the temple was destroyed. Judah, Benjamin, and some Levites. Jewish folks today can trace their family lineages from Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, none of the other ones. Temple is destroyed in 586, so 587 they're, they're transported out, 586 the temple's destroyed. The Babylonian Empire becomes the Persian Empire in 539, or when we get to the prophet Daniel, we'll talk about that. The Jewish people with their king Zerubbabel are allowed to start to return to Jerusalem in 538 BC. So under the Persian Empire, so the Persians have taken over the Babylonians, the King Cyrus permits them to come to back to the land. So I want to read a few passages here for you um, that will start to flesh this out because we're talking about history here but when you read through the prophets this history is going to be really important because who the prophets are talking to matters and when they're saying these things matters so let's go to Isaiah 44 and we're going to go to Isaiah 44 and we're going to go to verse 28 And it says, Who says to Cyrus? Now, Isaiah is prophesying this many years before Cyrus. Who says to Cyrus, my shepherd, he will fill all my pleasure, and says to Jerusalem, she will be rebuilt, and of the temple its foundation will be laid. Isaiah is prophesying that um, that Israel is going to be rebuilt. Now this might have been written after Isaiah died. Part of, I, part of the thing with the prophets, and we'll learn more about this when we talk about the prophets, is that their schools or their disciples continued and wrote in their fashion. It doesn't mean it's any less prophetic or less the word of God. What it does mean is that God is telling the people Jerusalem's going to be rebuilt. Now, I also want to go to Jeremiah 29. Now, Jeremiah is interesting in that he is known as the weeping prophet because he, he prophesied gloom and doom and the desolation. He was around when Babylon took over um, Jerusalem. He was there for all of that, and he t kept telling the people over and over again, this is going to happen. There's nothing you can do about it except surrender. Surrender and you'll live. Fight and you'll die. 
And that's exactly what happens. So Jeremiah 29, verse 10. For this is what the Lord says, when 70 years for Babylon are complete, I will attend to you and will confirm my promise concerning you to restore you to your place. So even Jeremiah is prophesying that there will be restoration of Israel. They're exiled, but they're going to be brought back. Remember, that's one of the themes we talked about, exile and return. We've been exiled from the garden, and the whole story of the, of the Bible is about our return to the garden. Um, Israel was exiled from the promised land into Egypt, but then returned back to the promised land. Israel was then exiled from the promised land again into Babylon, but now will return. All of these things happen, and Ezra is a person we need to know about. Ezra returns in 459 BC. He is in Babylon, and he is a priestly kind of guy. He returns in 459 BC. Uh, Nehemiah, so the Esther is, I'm sorry, the Ezra Nehemiah scroll, that's one big story of three different people, Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. Nehemiah returns in, in 455 BC, uh, 445 BC. And in Jeremiah 21, verses one through, uh, verse one through 29, 32, it talks about the surrender to the Babylonians. So I wanna read Jeremiah 38, 17. Okay, let me get there. Jeremiah 38, 17. Jeremiah therefore said to Zedekiah, so this is the last king of Israel before, the, uh, before they go off into exile. This is what the Lord, the God of armies, the God of Israel says, if indeed you surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, then you will live. This city will not be burned and you and your household will survive. But if you do not surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, then this city will be handed over to the Chaldeans Babylonians, and they will burn it, and you yourself will not escape them. Okay, Jeremiah says, surrender, you'll live, fight, and you die. They fought, but there were some that surrendered. There was some that were faithful and heard the words of Jeremiah. So people like Daniel and his three friends they were, they were exiled to Babylon, but they survived. The best and the brightest folks who survived the siege from Babylon were exiled up to uh, Babylon. When they went to Babylon, they brought with them, and they went into exile, they brought with them all of the writings. So all of the scrolls that have been, have been collected, the Torah, the Samuel scrolls, the King's scrolls, all of these, Ruth, a bunch of Psalms from David, um, writings from Solomon, all of these were brought with them into exile. During the exile, more writing happened. Daniel wrote, uh, Ezekiel, Esther, we're gonna talk about in a second. They were written. The Hebrew Bible, as we know it, the Old Testament is starting to come together within the form of the exile. Now let's talk about Esther. Um, there's a Bible Project video, which is very, very good. And I encourage you to watch that. I'll put a link in the description below to that video. Um, I encourage you to watch that. But there are basically in the book of Esther, which is happening during the exile, four main characters. The king, Mordecai, Hadassah, also called Esther, and that word means star, interesting, and a fellow named Haman. Let's talk about Haman for a second. Haman was a Canaanite. How do we know this? He was called an Agagite, from the king of Agag, of the Amalekites. 
Remember back in 1 Samuel, when Saul was supposed to destroy, completely destroy the Amalekites, and he didn't? Well, Haman is a descendant from that. Do you think he bears a grudge against Israel? I think he does. He was an Agagite. All the Amalekites in the family of Agag were to be killed. Saul neglected to do that. Now we have Haman. Haman was a relative of a family of a member of Agag who survived, and he built a 75-foot stake in order to impale Mordecai. Why? Because Mordecai offended him. Now, our English word uses the word gallows to describe what was being built. But for the Babylonians and the Assyrians, they didn't have, you know, the kind of gallows that we think of from, you know, the Wild West where, you know, built a hanging gallow and hung them. No, gallows were basically a big, huge stake in which they impaled the person and the person just sort of sat and rotted there. Lovely, huh? Yeah, well, that's what they did. So Haman built this 75 foot huge stake in the ground in order to impale Mordecai. So what is the point of Esther? Haman devises this plan to kill all the Jews. Esther, through some moral ambiguity of drinking, sex, murder, Despite God exiling his people, despite God's absence from the, from the nation and Israel's moral compromise, God has still not abandoned his promises. He still hasn't abandoned his promises. Why is the story so important to the Jewish people today as well as in the past? Well, Let's read Esther 5, and uh, this is really worth hanging on to. Esther chapter 5, and uh, we're going to read verses 12 through 15. What's more, Haman added, Queen Esther invited no one but me to join the king at a banquet she had prepared, I am invited again tomorrow to join her with the king. Still, none of this satisfies me since I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate all the time. His wife Zeresh and all his friends told him, have them build gallows 75 feet tall, ask the king in the morning to hang Mordecai, meaning impale him, then go to the banquet with the king and enjoy yourself. The advice please Haman, so he went to the gallows and constructed it. Why is it important to the Jews? Because back then there was a group of people that wanted to annihilate every single Jew on the planet. And today there are people who want to annihilate every single Jew on the planet. It's hideous. It is awful. It is, is anti-God. Because you remember, remember what God told Abraham. Everyone who blesses you will be blessed. Everybody who puts a curse on you will be cursed. That's why Balaam couldn't put a curse on Israel. Everyone who will bless you will be blessed. Everyone who places a curse on you will be cursed. There are still people who want to wipe off every single Jew from the world, push every single Jew into the, into the Mediterranean Sea in Israel. Esther is very important. The celebration of Purim, the celebration of, of Esther, is, is a beautiful celebration of remembering that God still cares for his chosen nation. Children, children dress up as the king or Mordecai or Esther. The book of Esther is read. And whenever Haman's name comes up, everybody boo, um, everybody shouts and blots out his name. And at the end of the book, Everybody eats cheesecake. I don't know why cheesecake, it's tasty. But it's a celebration. Read the book of Esther. It'll take you maybe half an hour, 45 minutes. It's worth reading. There's a lot of moral compromise in there amongst the characters, but God never 
leaves his people. So let's finish up our history. We've done a lot of history. But we're going to finish up with Ezra and Nehemiah, the Ezra and Nehemiah scroll. So, Ezra, part one, is the king Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, um, in Ezra 1 through 6, uh, the temple's destroyed in 50 years earlier. And for each person that we're going to talk about, Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah, there's a pattern. The Persian king sends a letter to Jerusalem, sends a leader to Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah. The leader encounters some form of opposition, and then we have this kind of unsatisfying ending. Zerubbabel is tasked to rebuild the temple, so he's sent back to rebuild the temple. He leads a group of people back to Judea, and this is in chapter 2 of Ezra. The people land, the people in the land whom the Babylonians left are asked to, they, they ask, can we participate in this? And Zerubbabel says, no, you have no part in the rebuilding of the temple. Remember, these are people that have been shipped in from other countries and they're basically pagans and idol worshipers. Those who attempted to intimidate the returning Jews and halt the building. So, the people that are left there tried to bully and intimidate Zerubbabel from building the temple. And they write to the new king of Persia. So Cyrus sent him down in between Cyrus dies and this new king Artaxerxes becomes, um, becomes king. And Artaxerxes commands them to stop. But then Artaxerxes is notified that, hey, Cyrus said they could do this. And Artaxerxes searched the court records, and sure enough, there's the court record saying they can do this, and they're allowed to start again. The temple is completed. Now, I want to read for you Ezra chapter 6. This is important because this is setting up the temple that will go up through Jesus' time up to 70 AD when the Romans destroy it again. The temple is rebuilt. It is nothing like the temple that Solomon built. It's far smaller. Herod tried to dress it up a bit and make it big, but he never got there. So in Ezra 6, we're going to start at chapter 16, and I'm going to read for you the dedication of the temple, but I want you to keep in mind what happened at the tabernacle and what happened at the dedication of Solomon's temple. See if you can spot what's missing here. Then the Israelites, including the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the exiles, celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. For the dedication of God's house, they offered 100 bulls, 200 rams, and 400 lambs, as well as 12 male goats, as a sin offering for all of Israel, one for each Israelite tribe. They also appointed the priests by their divisions, Levites for by their groups to the service of God in Jerusalem according to what is written in the book of Moses. The exiles observed the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. All of the priests and the Levites ceremonially, ceremonially clean because they had purified themselves. They killed the Passover lamb for themselves, their priestly brothers and all their exiles. The Israelites who had returned to exile ate it together with all who had separated themselves for un cleanliness of the Gentiles of the land in order to worship the Lord God of Israel. They observed the festival of unleavened bread for seven days with joy because the Lord had made them joyful, having changed the Assyrian king's attitude towards them, so he supported them in the work of the house of the God of Israel. What is missing? The glory cloud, the presence of God on the temple. And that's where we're going to leave it. So until next week, we're going to finish up history next week. Finish it up. So until then, this is uh, Chaplain Greg, Wandering Wesleyan. If you enjoy this uh, series, if you enjoy this channel, please like and subscribe on YouTube. And uh, I will see you next week. God bless.